Yeah. Do not want to miss that. You want to send your kids out there. I never, uh, I went to every church camp that you could possibly go to as a child, so, and that's why I'm still here today, so get your kids signed up for that, so. Uh, my parents are, they planned a, a trip for like two years, and they're on the trip now, so you get the good graces to have me today. <laughs> and uh, next week, next week, um, you don't want to miss out. Mark Bohr will be here. He's a, a pastor from Boise, Idaho. He has an explosively growing church, and uh, he's just an amazing teacher of the word, so you do not want to miss next week. But um, I'm going to have you stand up one more time. Even if you don't get anything out of church, you're going to get exercise. All right? <laughs> um, we're going to hold our Bibles up in the air. We're going to do our confession. Uh, I messed it up last time, apparently, so I had Brandon send it to me uh, so I can read it. I, I apologize, sincerely apologize. My dad said, you messed it up last time. I was like, I thought I did pretty good, but all right. I believe the Bible. It's God's word to me. I can have what it says I can have. I can be what it says I can be. I'll be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Today I receive the word as my life instruction manual. It's God's will that I'm healed. It's God's will that I'm blessed. My marriage is great. I am prosperous. The rest of my life will be the best of my life. Now shake hands with nine or 22 people, and then you can be seated. All right, all right. So we got the fifth Sunday today, a baby dedication. You already saw that happen. We're going to take communion here in a little bit. The ushers are going to pass out the communion elements right now. Um, and I want everybody in here to take them. Um, I know growing up, I kind of, when the communion was passed out, there's always this like, it, you think of an unworthy manner, right? First Corinthians, Paul was talking about taking communion in an unworthy manner. We're going to dive into that today. Um, and also, I'm wearing my all-in t-shirt. I'm not underdressed. I'm just wearing my t-shirt for this Sunday, okay? I was talking about that there. But open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 11. And Paul was talking to the Corinthians about how we're supposed to take the communion elements. The, the Corinthians were coming together, much like we do every Sunday morning. Um, and they were gathering together and having a meal together. And Paul was saying, hey, you guys really screwed up what you're supposed to be doing. From the, lo lo the Lord's Supper to what you guys are doing now, people are coming in. They're <laughs> I mean, people are literally showing up to church. They're gathering together. People are getting drunk, all right, drunk at church. There, it, it, was a, it was a thing with the haves and the have-nots. So 1 Corinthians eleven seven 7 says, Now I'm giving these instructions that I do not praise you. Since you come together not for the better, of, but for the worst. It's like, you guys are coming together for the worst. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. I, and I in part believe it. For there must also be factions among you that those who are approved by uh, being recognized among you. So you say basically saying like there's there's the rich people in here that are looking down on poor people. There's poor people looking up at the rich people. They're saying there's there was a division amongst them. Verse 21 it says, For in eating each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What do you not have houses to eat or drink in, or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? Says, I do not praise you. And then in verse 27, says, therefore, whoever eats of this bread and drinks of this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. I used to think that, like, when the communion was coming by, I had to, like, purge myself of sin. Like, oh, here it comes. I hope he doesn't pass the elements too quick or tell us to eat the bread too quickly because I'm not worthy of taking this. And God, that's not what he's saying here. He's saying, when you guys come together, when you guys take communion together, you can't be, uh, there can't be divisions among you. You can't be thinking this one way or, or another way. You can't be getting drunk, obviously, at church. Probably not a good idea. Um, <laughs> you, you, people are taking out of turn. They're eating all this stuff. It says, in 28, he says, But let a man examine himself, so let him eat the bread of, and drink of the cup. For he who drinks in an unworthy manner drinks judgment on himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, there are, there are weak and sick among you. Many sleep or die. For if we judge ourselves, we, we will not be judged. 
But when we are judged, we are chastised by the Lord <clears throat> that may not condemn in the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together, eat, wait for one another. But if any of you is hungry, let him go eat at home. Let's one comes together for judgment. So he's saying, hey, this is not what this is for. It's not for you to come and get food. And obviously, like, we don't, we're, I mean, we're going to eat afterwards. But it's not, they were coming together, and they did this on a, on a weekly basis. They examined the Sabbath, and they came together, and they remembered what God did in their lives and what God has delivered them from. And he's saying, hey, don't, don't pervert this. Don't, don't just come here hungry. Oh, I'm going to get the bread. I'm going to get the wine. You know, but pe people are eating everything, and other people are going to have stuff. So that's what he's talking about in an unworthy manner. It's not you who makes yourself worthy. It's Jesus who makes you worthy, right? So instead of focusing on the sin in your life here during this time, not, you don't focus on the sin. You focus on what Jesus did. That's what he's saying right here, right? So Matthew 26, it says, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, uh, verse 23. He blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body. He then took the, thing, the cup and gave thanks. And gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many in remissions of sin. But I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of this vine until the day when I drink it new with you, my Father's kingdom. And they sung a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. So they're getting together. This was not a, the Passover was something that was already in place in the Jews, and that, that they remembered Egypt, how God delivered them from this. But he's saying, This is a different, this is a different thing now. This is a new covenant for you. This isn't just, this isn't just, this isn't just remembering the past, but it's what God is doing in your life today. First Corinthians, for as often you eat of this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We have to remember the sacrifice that did, what the sacrifice did for us. So I, I used to think that I had to be worthy of communion. Man, the devil wants you to feel unworthy. He wants to keep you in your sin. He wants you to not examine your righteousness on a daily basis. Man, you can take communion at home. You don't have to even, you, I mean, you can sit there and, and say, God, I, I remember your blood. I remember your flesh. I remember what you did for me, and it has to be on a daily basis. It has to be. If you want things to change in your life, it has to be daily. <laughs> it's so important. It says, give us this day our daily bread. It has to be daily bread to you, right? The word of God has to be daily bread for you. So when we take the communion elements, we, we remember the cross. We remember the sacrifice. Remember the lamb that was slain for us. He's not saying get introspective. Don't do that. Don't sit here and try to get introspective of what you, what you did last week. Hey, man, my dog got in the trash, so I kicked her. <laughs> Or I yelled at my kids, or I cut that guy off in traffic, or, you know, I, you know, whatever the sin is in your life, this is not the time to examine it. You're examining what God did to cover those sins. The blood covers the sin. It's not focusing on how good you are. It's about how good God is. Hebrews 10, 17, uh, 10 8 it says, previously saying sacrifice and offering are burnt offering and offerings for sin. You do not desire nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to you to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, and that he may establish the second. And if you skip down to uh, verse 15, it says, But the Holy Spirit also witnesses for us, that he has said before, that this is the covenant that I will make with them. And those are the days, says the Lord, that I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds, and I will, I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and lawless, lawless deeds I will remember no more. If God doesn't remember your sin, then why are you? Man, that's, that's the, that is, the devil is the author of confusion. He wants to keep you in your bondage. He wants to keep you in your sin. He wants to keep you focused on how good you aren't or what you did. But that's not Jesus. There's going to be burdens lifted this morning. The things that you focus on that you think that you can't get out of, uh, the, the yoke that you feel like you have to carry in sin, those are going away today. The blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And, and when we drink the blood, it cleanses us and it covers us, right? But it's by grace through faith. It's not just Jesus did something on the cross, but it's up to us 
to receive it, right? You can't just say, yeah, Lord, I, you know, I'm going to get into heaven by receiving you as my Savior. But if you want the things, the circumstances to change in your life, if you want things to manifest in your life, if you want uh, healing, you want prosperity, you have to work by grace through faith. It's us as Christians. So how do we do this unworthily now? We're not coming in. I mean, we're obviously not drinking wine and we're not drinking bread. But how we do it unworthy now is that it becomes a routine. All right, you come in here. It's like, yeah, they're doing communion today. Cool. The crackers taste like crap. The wine is whatever. These packets are hard to open. Like, I get it. But that can't become your routine. Because nothing about Christ is routine. And if, you, if, if, you, if it becomes routine to you, that's what the Pharisees were doing in the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, they're trying to challenge Jesus because, like, hey, we already know this routine. We got all this stuff. And then they try to, they try to stump them on questions. They try to, they try to uh, uh, yeah, stump him in, 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 the, in, the, in the law. And Jesus is like, no, man, you guys are just stale. It just became a routine to you. Communion cannot become a routine. And we only do it what, four, day, four, four times a year now on every fifth Sunday. But, man, it can't become a routine. We have to examine and we've got to focus on the bread. We can't make it, we can't ritualize it. We have to focus daily what Jesus did. In Mark 7, it was the Phoenician Gentile woman in uh, verse 24. So there he rose, and he went to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered the house and wanted, to know, and wanted no one to know it. But he could not be hidden, for a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him. Thank you. But Jesus said to her, let the children be filled first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it away to the little dogs. And he answered and said to him, yes, Lord, even the little dogs under the table eat from your children's crumbs. Then he said to her, for this saying, go your way, the demon has gone out of your daughter. And when she came back to her house, she found the demon gone out of her daughter lying in bed. Jesus called this woman a dog. Do you understand that? <laughs> like, that would have pissed me off. I'm sorry. I, that would have made me mad. <laughs> if somebody calls me a dog, that's not exactly what you want to hear. But she was under a different, she wasn't a part of the Jewish tradition. She wasn't a part of the Israelites. She was a, a Gentile. She wasn't a part of that covenant. <laughs> and she's saying, even the little dogs get the crumbs off the master's table. Right? She was correctly identifying the body of Christ. Right? God was, he called her a dog because he was bringing dormant faith out of her. That made her so mad that it's like, no, I don't care what you just called me. I'm going to, whatever you got, I'm getting. It doesn't matter what circumstance, what, what bloodline that I come from, because now that you are here, I'm getting that. I mean, you think about it. The woman with the issue of blood. God's body was so powerful that people just touched the hem of his garment and people were healed. We have that right here. If you don't make it familiar, if you really examine God's body, some of you have dormant faith that's been laying around for years. And man, your healing is here. Your healing, your circumstances. God died on the cross. Jesus died on the cross and he took over everything. But it's us, up to us to grab it, to get out there. <clears throat> In John 6, 35, and he said that I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus flesh carried healing power. In John 6, I'm not going to go into all the scriptures, but in John 6, he's basically telling, telling the, the, the Jews before, he's like, that manna from heaven, that wasn't what Moses did. That was me. He was talking about his flesh. The Israelites, for 40 years, after they were eradicated from slavery, for 40 years walked in supernatural health because they were daily taking God's body. And he's like, well, that was them back then. Now, I'm telling you, you can live in supernatural health. That's why he's saying many of you sleep, many of you are sick, because you're not doing, you're not examining what this is. You're not examining the price that God paid on the cross. They had perfect healing. So 
So Passover, when the, the Israelites were still in slavery, I love this. Israelites were still in slavery. God said, paint the door with the blood of Jesus, which covers our sin. So they painted the door, and they remembered Passover. And he was saying, sorry. In Psalm 105, 37, he said, he also brought them out with silver and gold, and there was none feeble among his tribes. I was saying, like, when they examine the Passover and the ritual that they were doing, when they examine that, they're ready to go in, into a different area, into a, a, into a promised land. So the Jews remember Passover by eating matzo crackers. If you can pull that picture up. They, so they, they like, nasty-looking crackers. Um, but the thing about the Passover is that every Passover, they would bring, they would have these crackers, and they had to be unleavened. They had to be pierced with holes. They had to be striped, and they had to be burnt. Type and shadow. Those are my favorite things in the Bible that just blow my mind. But Jesus was burnt by the wrath of God. He became sin. He knew no sin, but he became sin. So God could eliminate sin from our lives or cover our sin. He was pierced. He was striped. By Jesus' stripes, we were healed. All these things happened to Jesus. And the Jews were actually already examining Passover before, long before Jesus came. But think of it. When they're getting out of Egypt, where were they leaving? They're leaving slavery. They're leaving fear. They're leaving poverty. Jesus said, it was said that, uh, it says, through his poverty, we became rich. Some people say that, oh, that's spiritual riches. That's like one of my favorite things. There's a guy that piped up in one of my dad's services a long time. Said, that's spiritual riches. I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> Every time rich is used in the New Testament, it's, it's talking about finances. So all these things happen through communion. Your sickness, your poverty, everything we're enslaved to. Look at Acts 2, 46. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with the people, and the Lord added to the church daily who were being saved. What if we remember daily what Jesus did on the cross? I want to have an Acts 2 church. I want this church to be an Acts 2 church. I want to see miracles. I want to see the dead raised alive. I want to see blind eyes open. I want to see uh, the deaf to hear. I want all this stuff to happen. But it doesn't happen without examining God's body, his death, his burial, and resurrection on a daily basis. Exodus 12, 11 says, And thus you shall eat it with the belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in hand, so you shall eat in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. He's saying, get ready. He's not just saying, yeah, we'll just sit here and we'll eat this cracker and drink this stuff and then we'll go eat outside. He's saying, get ready for what is going to happen in your life. He's preparing your dormant faith by the communion elements. He's saying, I've already done it, man. My blood was shed for your sins. My body was broken for your healing. Everything that, that, that pertains to life and godliness is in these communion elements. So we can't ritualize it. He wants to hear your body. He wants to repair your circumstances. Isaiah 53, 5 says, He was wounded for your transgressions. He was bruised for your iniquities. And the chastisement of peace was upon him. By Jesus' stripes, we were, here. we were healed. Man, do you believe that? You're here. Do you believe that? Do you believe what God can do through us remembering his body? Let's open up the communion elements. We're going to partake of the, the juice first. God, we thank you for your blood. Your blood that covers, eradicates, removes all sin consciousness, Lord. Thank you for the, the peace that comes through your blood, God, that we don't have to live in sin anymore. 
God, we praise you and thank you. We do not take it lightly what you did on the cross, God. What you, what you did in our lives, we remember it, Lord. God, we just thank you for your blood. The, the price that you paid was gruesome, horrendous, God. And we just thank you for the grace that you put in our lives, Lord. Let's partake of the with juice. And under the flesh. Just like Israel was removed out of slavery and bondage, I believe that God can break chains from your life today through the blood and the body of Jesus. And in Acts 2, again, it says, Praising God and having favor with all people, but they are breaking food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Praising God. After we eat this, let's praise God. And, 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 w- and when you're done, with this, if you're getting baptized, we're going to go into the back after we eat this together, um, and we're going to celebrate what God is doing in people's lives. But God, we thank you for your body that was broken for us, God. You're wounded for our transgressions. You're bruised for our iniquities, and by Jesus' stripes, we were healed, God. We just thank you and praise you for the, the sacrifice that you made on that cross, Lord, that, that we can walk in divine healing. We can, we can walk in divine health, God. Every circumstance in our life that needs to be turned around is going to be turned around by your blood and what you did for us, God. And we just praise you and thank you for the price that you paid. Let's partake of the the body. So if you're getting baptized, if you want to make your way to the back, Matthew 28. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of an age. Amen. The people that are getting baptized, this is not to be taken lightly. This is a big deal. I was talking about in our early meeting, I was wearing black, and in the, uh, the movie Walk the Line, I don't know how the validity of this, but Johnny Cash was sitting in the back in there, they're saying, you're wearing black, what are you doing? Are you going to a funeral? And he says, maybe I am. And I think about people choosing to put off the old man, to leave that dead, to leave that dormant when they're beginning baptized and rise out of that water a different creation. Paul said, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. And we think of the word baptizing as you going under water and the coming up. But the baptism, the actual word baptism in the Bible was referring to is when, when they would dye clothing or they would uh, dye fabric, they would submerse that into a dye. And every fabric, every uh, part of that clothing would be submerged and changed in that dunking. So that's what they're talking about when we're baptizing people. It's not just... You going under water and coming up, it's, you're coming up as a, something different, that God is, God is bringing you to a new life. And that is so important that we celebrate this, man. I, I love seeing baptism. Seeing the mic. 